Thanks all. Um, if you'd like to place in the chat below where you're visiting from tonight, it's well, this is one of the exciting things about the online opportunities is that we're really gathering from all over the country. As we just wait a few more minutes here before we begin tonight's programming, uh, it's really fun to see where everyone is gathering from. I'm from Annapolis, Maryland, although my name is Alyssa Edwards and I'm the Music Education and Outreach Officer here at the Cathedral. It's wonderful to have you with us. Well, folks, it's nearly uh, five past seven, uh, and I think we have a lot of people already here and um, uh, not wanting to make the evening too long. I'm going to suggest we start off in just a second. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Mike McCarthy, Director of Music and actually uh, uh, Wayne's successor um, and uh, extremely large shoes um, to fill uh, and it's been a tremendous uh, honor in this position. Um, I've met, a, I, I know uh, Mark uh, and Rick and Jeff uh, relatively well across these years. I sadly never got to meet Wayne. Uh, and by that, I mean, it was just by, a, by weeks really, uh, when I was um, interviewing for the position here at the cathedral. Uh, Wayne, I know I knew at the time was ill, but I had assumed that uh, by the time I was going to be back um, at the cathedral, maybe in in harness, that I would have a chance to meet up with him. Uh, and sadly, that was not the case. Uh, my last trip had been in June, uh, and I was just basically wrapping up um, uh, just uh, details about the position. And then by the time I was back here in August, um, the first thing I did as director of music at the cathedral uh, with the cathedral choir and first service I did was Wayne's funeral service. Um, so uh, I feel some, uh, some sort of unique connection to him a little bit because in some respects that was the greatest, if I was not to meet him in person, at that service, which was, was a magnificent day, I got to meet everybody <laughs> who had been part of Wayne's life, who had been part of the cathedral's life. Everybody, of course, came. And on my first day in the job, I managed to meet, gosh, years of musical history uh, from the cathedral. So it was a, it was a very um, poignant and sad uh, moment, but it was also a tremendous gift to me. I'm thrilled that we can do this. Um, at this time, COVID has presented so many uh, challenges. Uh, and yet in this year, it's important that we remember and recognize and honor Wayne. And I'm so glad as we've come together with the Sacred Music Festival that we can have uh, some experience of Wayne as the musician, which we will um, get to hear, but also to have some conversation about Wayne the man um, and the dad uh, and the great musician who has inspired so many. So I'm sort of really grateful for you all to come here tonight. I'm grateful particularly to Mark Dirksen who has worked tirelessly on this program. And I uh, just welcome you all. And I hope we have a, an evening of, of great celebration and great conversation. Uh, and it's a thrill for, for, for me to welcome you. On to the show.
was a wonderful performance that uh, we had recorded earlier this year at our Lessons and Carols service, uh, which was an online production as well. So that was a, a wonderful rendition. But uh, without further delay, again, I'd like to welcome everyone. I think we had some new participants joining us with as uh, the last piece was playing uh, to the centenary celebration of Richard Wayne Dirksen. The centenary year we recall his life and work with an online event with our keynote lectures and current and archival performances. And at the very end of tonight's evening, we'll follow up with a panel discussion and a virtual reception. So we are looking forward to connecting more with you then. So without any uh, adieu, I am excited to introduce Neil Campbell to you this evening. Neil Campbell is the organist of Trinity Episcopal Church in Vero Beach in Florida. He grew up in Washington, D.C., and while a student at the University of Maryland, he studied organ with Paul Calloway at the National Cathedral, which also gave him the opportunity to observe rehearsals and services in the cathedral during this time. After leaving the D.C. area, he earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the Manhattan School of Music, including a doctoral degree for which he wrote his dissertation on the life and works of the New York composer organist Harold Fidel. A scholar particularly of 20th century American church musicians, his expertise and knowledge of Dirksen's life and music makes him an invaluable resource to this evening's event. So we're very delighted to welcome you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm honored to be part of this for festivities honoring Richard Wayne Dirksen. Professionally, he was known as Richard Dirksen. That's the way he would be listed as a composer or a performer in a program or an order of service. But to his family and friends and to certainly everyone at the cathedral, he was known as Wayne. So that's how I'll refer him to, to him this evening. There's an awful lot of biographical information out there about him, beginning with the comprehensive website rwdirksen.com, developed by Mark Dirksen, which I highly recommend. Each thread of his life and work is treated comprehensively there and is worth exploring in detail. And I could easily fill up my entire allotted time by going down any one of those rabbit holes. But in a nutshell, the thing to take away, I think, is that I, Wayne could have had a very successful and effective career in any number of fields. He could have been a concert organist, a composer, both in classical and popular theater idioms, a conductor, teacher, administrator, a producer or impresario, organ builder, church musician, or a clergyman. Actually, his career was a synthesis of each of these disciplines, and they were practiced at a very high level of achievement at the Washington National Cathedral, where he spent his entire career. He grew up with the cathedral from 1942 until its completion in 1990 and his retirement shortly after that. In an annotated catalog that Wayne prepared in his retirement, he tells of the impact that the cathedral itself, the actual building of the cathedral, had on his compositions. He says, its magnitude and beauty offer endless inspiration to the artist and ennoble the richness of its worship and culture. An incomparable aesthetic paragon it is unlimited in challenge for special gifts and service, ever inviting discerning attention and attracting excellence. The briefest thumbnail sketch of his life might read something like this. He was born into a musical family, sang as a choir boy in the local Episcopal church, excelled in instrumental music in high school. He gained a scholarship to Hobart College where he had planned to study for the ministry but he felt called to study music seriously. So he spent a gap year studying piano, organ, and theory with Hugh Price to prepare him for an audition to one of the major conservatories. Hugh Price incidentally had been one of Virgil Fox's teachers and uh, Wayne ultimately gained a full scholarship and was offered admission as a student of Virgil Fox at Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore. While he was at Peabody, he became assistant organist to Paul Calloway at the cathedral he went into the army, came back to the cathedral, and stayed there for the rest of his life. An interesting sidebar to the biographical uh, sketch there, in the army, he was assigned to be a chaplain's assistant at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington. 
in that capacity, he played uh, the organ for services in the chapel, and he also had some maintenance and sexton type duties. But this was a beautiful chapel, obviously inspired by the English country parish churches, and it had a very nice three manual Skinner organ that he played. But he was also in charge of the campus radio station, where he developed his interest in broadcasting and producing. He and his team were very creative in their offerings, to the point where in December 1943, there was a feature article by none other than Meyer Berger in the New York Times Magazine. And a copy of that article is available on the Dirksen Centennial website. Wayne and Paul each served in the Army. Wayne enlisted and Paul was drafted. Serving in their absence for the duration was a man named Ellis Varley, a name I had not known until I began this research for this talk. But Varley went on to serve at the Cathedral in Detroit, the Cathedral of St. Paul, and later in Jacksonville, Florida, the Cathedral of St. John. Wayne and Paul were reunited at the cathedral after the war, and Wayne's main job was to train the junior choir and to direct them for their early Sunday service in Bethlehem Chapel. He and Paul shared some of the playing duties of the volunteers, but the typical drill was that Paul played the entire service, including the hymns and the anthem accompaniments, and conducted the choir from the organ. And Wayne's main job was essentially to be a page turner. In 1999, uh, Wayne was interviewed for a doctoral dissertation about the cathedral's music, and he says, Wayne says this, by 1950, he was getting a cystinitis, he called it, and working for Callaway involved a lot of page turning, and he felt he was just hanging around too much. So it was that shortly after this, he added to his duties and became the director of the combined glee clubs for the National Cathedral School for Girls and the St. Albans School for Boys in which capacity he remained until 1969, almost 20 years. Two things obtained immediately from that appointment. For the first time, the combined glee clubs were able to sing a full complement of SATB music because the two schools were combined and the young men from St. Albans, voices had changed and could sing the tenor and the bass parts. And Wayne really put them to their task in singing serious choral literature and in composing new works for them including some Advent and Christmas pageants and several operettas, which were part of the school spring program. And some of these things were even reviewed in the Washington paper. Uh, of course, it didn't hurt that Paul Hume sang in the Cathedral Choir at the time. And uh, Day Thorpe was uh, one of the coterie of uh, his friends. And he was in charge of the music review at the other newspaper, the evening paper, the Washington Star. And the second thing that resulted in this, Wayne's glee clubs began to appear more often at special services and events in the cathedral, particularly some of the special services commemorating or you know, dedicating newly built portions of the cathedral. And occasionally they would function as the liturgical choir at a service in the absence of the cathedral's own choir. I'm not sure when Wayne seriously started composing in his Peabody notebook, there's an ink manuscript of a solo song that is likely his first serious composition. It's titled Benedicite, and it's not the prayer book canticle of that same name, but rather a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier, and it begins, God's love and peace be with thee, wheresoe'er this soft autumnal air lifts the dark tresses of thy hair. And it's dedicated to Joan, his high school sweetheart and later his wife. During his gap year following high school, he know he studied theory with Hugh Price. And of course, he would have been exposed to the rudiments of composition in his conservatory curriculum. But he was basically self-taught as a composer. After his service in the army, it was his intent to move to New York and enter the world of the theater, writing and producing on Broadway. The idea of spending his entire career at the cathedral was not on his radar screen at all. But those who left positions to serve in the war were entitled to return to them when the war was over. So when he did come back to the cathedral, and we know how it turned out from there. Very quickly, Wayne's compositions began to appear on the cathedral's music lists. And Wayne often said that Paul Calloway basically performed whatever he wrote, and that he, Wayne, received a valuable composer's laboratory, having the services of a skilled professional ensemble to explore fully what did and did not work as he advanced his compositional skills. And in return for which, of course, the cathedral got a composer in residence. Wayne jokingly has said that he was an occasional composer. 
by which he meant that most of his compositions were written for a specific event or were commissioned by others to commemorate some specific event. And his annotated catalog gives great detail of these. Hymns or anthems for students, church anniversaries, weddings and christenings of family and friends, a fanfare of a specific length to cover some use during a broadcast. Uh, at one time, the principal musicians of the National Symphony Orchestra formed an ensemble and they commissioned him to write a new piece for their inaugural performance at the Phillips Collection, uh, an, an art gallery near DuPont Circle that had a serious musical program. In 1950, for the opening of the Carter Baron Amphitheater in Rock Creek Park, Wayne was commissioned to write the complete orchestral score for Paul Green's production titled Faith of Our Fathers, which, was which commemorated the 150th anniversary of the District of Columbia. And some of this music's on the uh, website, the Dirksen website, and if you listen to it, you'll get an idea of his distinct commercial style. It's, it's very reminiscent of some of the slick documentary soundtracks you might hear of that day, but it gives an idea of the versatility he had as a composer. The ongoing building of the cathedral provided various landmarks along the way for celebrations and dedications as different portions of the cathedral were built and dedicated. And in retrospect, you can view these events as chapters in Wayne's own compositional development. The first significant one of those was in 1957 and it observed the 50th anniversary of the laying of the foundation stone of the cathedral. And for that, Wayne composed Welcome All Wonders. Later, such events included the dedication of the glory in Chelsea's Tower in 1964. The entire bicentennial year of 1976 featured several significant major services that Wayne composed music for and uh, had other administrative and entrepreneurial responsibilities as well. And of course, the completion of the cathedral in 1990 was a significant event toward the end of his career. But I think one of the most significant of those dedications occurred in 1962. This observed the completion of the South Transept. Up to this point, if you can visualize it, uh, the cathedral consisted entirely of the great choir and the North Transept and an incomplete uh, crossing to sort of you know, tie the two together. But with the completion of the South Transept and the crossing, for the first time, it was possible to really fully contemplate what the completed cathedral would look like looking east and what it would feel like and what it would sound like. One could sit on the main floor looking east to, to the choir and beyond to the altar and it would look just like it looks today with the full width of the transit arms uh, finally available in the complete crossing. And for this dedication in 1962, Wayne wrote his cantata, The Fiery Furnace. And in his annotated catalog, he devotes a lot of space describing it, both the composition itself, the dedicatory occasion, and particularly the details of, of the construction and the sculptural iconography that inspired it. Uh, all of the bosses and the ribs of the, of the South Transit are based on one of the verses of the Bene Dici Te. You know, praise the Lord for the hail and the snow and the fire and all that. And each boss represents one of them. And he goes into great detail describing it. And it's a perfect example of Wayne's assertion that it was a combination of the occasion and of the cathedral itself that was the impetus for most of his compositions. The Fiery Furnace calls for music of equal importance from three distinct groups in three distinct locations. And uh, Wayne goes into great detail about describing how during the prelude to the service, the full Cathedral Choral Society of 200 people marched in and you know, went up into the, uh, the most two eastward bays of the great choir. Uh, the two glee clubs of the choir school made a left uh, at the crossing and went up into the uh, North Transit Gallery, and the Men and Boys Choir went into the, their usual place in the choir to sing Evensong. And uh, after Evensong was over, they had a, a little procession and some stations at various places as the Cathedral Choir made their way up to the South Transit. And then they began this uh, work, The Fiery Furnace. And Wayne describes it again in his catalog saying this, three powerful unison trumpet calls sounded in the North Balcony were immediately echoed by an orchestral statement in the South. The reverberation was gathered up in a powerful organ chorus that fired off the 200 voices of the Cathedral Choral Society singing, Nebuchadnezzar the King made an image of gold. It was instantly heard that the South transept 
space made a dramatic and beautiful increase in the acoustical dimensions of the cathedral. And the recording of the complete fiery furnace is on the website. But as I say, it, it, uh, the work quotes the entire canticle of Benedicite Omnia Opera, O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord, praise him and magnify him forever. It's a long text and the full setting takes about eight minutes, but here's about half of that sung by the Cathedral Choir of Men and Boys.
my family moved to Washington in 1959, and in the ensuing years, they would take us on usual sightseeing trips. And I can vividly remember one Saturday afternoon, we went to the cathedral and crowd control and security wasn't what it is now. We just sort of wandered around at will. And I can remember going up into the South Transit Gallery and there was a rehearsal going on. And there was this little man there in the And uh, okay. there was a little man in, in charge there. And I can remember over and over and over, start, he started that opening cue with the uh, with the uh, tambourine. And of course, it was only many years later that I realized that I'd stumbled in on the, probably the dress rehearsal for this service the next day, and that little man was Paul Calloway. Anyway, one of Wayne's other duties as assigned was to be the rehearsal accompanist for the Cathedral Choral Society. And as such, he had firsthand intimate performers familiarity with an awful lot of the choral repertoire from all eras, with a particular emphasis on contemporary work. In the season leading up to the South Transit dedication, this would have included Stravinsky's Threnny, Hindemith's Requiem, which by the way, Hindemith himself came to direct, uh, Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, and William Walton's Belshazzar's Feast. I think you can hear traces of each of these composers' works throughout Wayne's uh, opus list. Not just to the point that all of these composers, I think, influenced uh, Wayne in that. The recording we just heard, uh, they used it again in 1964 for the Ascension Day festivities and uh, with a lot of other music. And they made a studio recording. They had a recording session of some of that. And that's what we heard just now. It wasn't the actual performance. And Wayne was actually conducting that uh, studio recording session that we just heard. Um, by the way, there was a copy of this two uh, LP commemorative album that was in the Tacoma Park Library that I seem to have checked out in perpetuity when I was growing up. And other works for, that were commissioned for that 1964 tower dedication included works of Samuel Barber, Lee Hoyby, Stanley Hollingsworth, Roy Hamlin Johnson, John LaMontagne, Milford Meyer, Ned Roram, and Leo Sowerby. Quite a lineup. In the early 1960s, Wayne was asked to chair the committee planning for the construction and the installation of the bells in the tower, both the carillon and the 10 bell ring. Washington Cathedral is the only tower in the world that has each has a carillon and a 10 bell ring. And Wayne and his team from the cathedral were sent to England for the purpose of you know, studying its implementation and getting ready for its installation. And it's clear that he absorbed every aspect of the bells in its practical construction terms. But it also stimulated his interest in bells from a compositional standpoint. He used bells a lot in his work. The cathedral had a, ten bell, a set of the ten white chapel handbells, which replicated the pitches of the ten bell ring in the tower. Ostensibly, these were for practice and change ringing, but they saw a lot of use in the performance of Wayne's compositions over the years. Since Wayne had been asked to chair the committee planning for the 1964 Ascension Day Tower dedication, uh, he stepped down as the associate organist and choir master of the cathedral. And his duties were assumed, assumed by Norman Scribner, who went on to become a well-known choral conductor in Washington, and David Coring was one of the fellows of the new Cathedral College of Church Musicians. Following the success of the tower dedication, festivities, Dean Sayer began to ponder the program of the cathedral and he envisioned it taking on an enlarged role as a venue to offer important programs involving all of the fine arts. The new tower ensured the cathedral's strong visual presence on the city skyline and its newer unified interior crossing space offered a unique performance venue. Up to this point, the actual building of the cathedral together with its services were the program. It was a pretty big program actually, but to implement this new initiative, Wayne Dirksen was given the task on a three-year trial basis. And he was given the title Director of an Advanced Program. And of course his work lasted in that capacity for well over a decade. As a Director of Advanced Program, he began and directed all of the activities for the summer festivals which was six or seven programs you know, in the summer. Most of them were in the cathedral, but some of them were outside. And these included things like the medieval play of Daniel that the New York Pro Musica and Noah Greenberg brought to the cathedral and the light in the wilderness an oratorio by Dave Brubeck and other artistic things involving dance, theater and art. 
And Wayne also began as part of this initiative, the Open House in the fall, which he directed for many years. In 1969, he was made presenter of the cathedral, was the first layperson to hold that title in a cathedral in the Anglican Communion, and it really attracted quite wide press. And in that uh, position, he directed all aspects of the cathedral's worship life. Uh, several departments, including music, altar and flower guilds, vergers and maintenance, visitor services, especially as it related to musical groups and speakers. And his annual reports to the dean and chapter are absolutely staggering in the detail that he was in charge of, both in terms of the number of people involved in the budget and the various overlaying tasks that he coordinated. Cathedral services had often been broadcast beginning in the early days of radio and later uh, in television throughout the 50s and 60s. And by that time, it was traditional Christmas Day that uh, the, the morning Eucharist was broadcast on national TV and Wayne produced these scripted booklets that the choir and all the participants followed. And they were you know, timed down to the precise minute. And uh, they were really quite precise and he was very good at putting those sorts of things together. In 1977, when Paul Calloway retired, Wayne was appointed the fourth organist and choir master uh, while he continued his duties as presenter. In 1983, he was named canon presenter in honor of his 40th year of the cathedral. He and Richard Feller, the clerk of the works for many years, were the two laypersons named as canons that year. In 1984, following the retirement of Paul Calloway as the founding director of the Cathedral Choral Society, Wayne served as the interim director for a year while they searched for a permanent director. And that person was none other than Riley Lewis, who had been a, one of Wayne's choir boys in the junior choir. And, and uh, Riley served in that position until he died in 2016. In 1988, as the completion of the cathedral loomed on the horizon, Wayne resigned as organist and choir master to become the coordinator for festivities surrounding the consecration of the completed cathedral and he was succeeded by Douglas Major. 1991, Wayne resigned, uh, retired, and there were significant observances in the cathedrals and the schools. And on the website, there's a wonderful 30 minute piece of, of one of the events at the school where groups of students came back and sang some of his music uh, from some of the operettas they had done. And it's, it, it's a, a wonderful thing. In closing, I want to make just a few mention of some of Wayne's non-cathedral activities. Uh, simultaneous with all that he did at the cathedral, it's staggering to me to realize how much else he did, but uh, he always had several other things in the fire. Uh, he taught at American University, and particularly in his early days at the cathedral, he directed a lot of community choirs. It was common for certain businesses and government organizations as part of their you know, benefits for uh, activities for employees to have these various glee clubs and he directed things like the B&O Women's Glee Club of Baltimore and uh, there are several local theater groups that he composed for and did some producing for things like the Albany Theater. I mentioned the Phillips Collection earlier this art gallery in downtown Washington that had a serious music program and Wayne did a lot of work there including things like accompanying as a collaborative uh, pianist with the principal players of the National Symphony and things like the complete Mozart sonatas for violin and piano and the complete trios for violin and cello with uh, the concert master and first cellist of the National Symphony. He uh, also in 1971 found duty playing a temporary organ at the premiere of the Kennedy Center when he played the organ part in Bernstein's Mass. And uh, in the ensuing years when they got the new Aeolian Skinner organ in the Kennedy Center Concert Hall. He often played when they needed an organ part for the symphony. The symphony didn't have an organist as such, but Wayne often did that. And I can remember when I was singing with the University of Maryland Chorus once we were doing the uh, Dvorak Requiem, and there was a big section with the chorus and the organ was undergirding it, and Antal Dorati was the conductor, and he stopped all the proceedings, and he looked over in Wayne's general direction, he says, organ. Can we have some more of these 16s and these 32 foot tones? And of course, knowing the late Alien Skinner style, which is pretty thin, I just thought to myself, well, good luck with that. But uh, I don't know what Wayne did. He probably played everything down a, an octave, but it, it satisfied the maestro's uh, requirement anyway. Wayne was also known as a continual player on harpsichord, particularly. And 
he was a good improviser working from figure bass and he found duty playing for any number of Baroque concerts throughout the area. Late in his life, he had honors came to him. He got an honorary doctorate from uh, George Washington University and from Mount Union College in Ohio, as well as alumni awards from Peabody and a distinguished service award from the Shenandoah Conservatory. Throughout all this time, he continued to compose. He had this parallel track with all of his other activities in composing throughout his life. And, uh, but at this time, particularly the Episcopal Church was putting out a new hymnal and six of his hymn tunes are in the hymnal 1982. Uh, undoubtedly the most popular is Vineyard Haven. Uh, but he had six hymn tunes, a couple of Anglican chants. And for the new Episcopal prayer book, he composed, composed through settings of the three songs of Isaiah, which are wonderful pieces that were premiered at 1982 AGO convention by the Choir of St. Thomas Church from New York, directed by Jerry and Judy Hancock. Also in the early 60s, after the, particularly after the tower dedication festivities, he uh, started to get offers for other jobs. He turned down uh, the offer to become the Dean of the Oberlin Conservatory. And uh, Grace Church in New York uh, pursued him actively. And there's a wonderful letter, a carbon copy of a letter from Dean Sayre to the new rector of Grace Church, the Reverend George Menifee. And uh, Father Menifee uh, arrived to Grace Church and they had a very famous organist named Ernest Mitchell, who was finally retiring. And uh, Father Menifee is writing Dean Sayre to inquire if perhaps uh, uh, Wayne Dirksen would be interested in coming to him. Uh, and a very endearing letter from Dean Sayre, wishing the new rector good luck in his new ministry and all that sort of thing. He says, except for one thing, he implores him to look somewhere else other than Washington Cathedral to find his new organist. He says that uh, should either Paul or Wayne leave, one of the greatest joys of his being Dean would go with them. And uh, he said that Father Menifee would do him a great service if he would tell him what exalted salary he was contemplating offering Wayne so that the cathedral could offer to match it and get him to stay. But it's a, he concludes by saying, of course, he wouldn't uh, want to impede Wayne's taking the job if he really wanted to leave. But he says that the combination of Paul and Wayne at the cathedral is heaven itself. He actually says that in writing, that the work of Paul and Wayne at the cathedral is magic itself. The year before he died, Wayne spoke to a local group for the Association of Anglican Musicians, and he said this, I conclude these remarks with a quotation that has been of greatest theological influence in my creativity. Louis Pasteur wrote, the Greeks understood hidden power of things infinite. They bequeathed to us one of the most beautiful words in our language, the word enthusiasm, entheos, a God within. The grandeur of human actions is measured by the inspiration from which they spring. Happy is he who bears a God within and who obeys it. The ideals of art, of science, are highlighted by reflections from the infinite. My succinct perspective is this. When people perform music together, that enthusiasm within each engenders a community-wide awareness of those reflections of the infinite. The sharing of a God within through making of music puts us in unison touch with the infinite God and intensifies our knowledge of and enthusiasm for him. Collectively, therefore, do we embody and live our theology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That was incredibly fascinating and um, and completely illuminating as well. So thank you so much. Pleasure. And we'll look forward to chatting with you more in the okay. portion of the evening. All right. So uh, during Wayne's 49 years at the cathedral, he left this wonderful legacy of brilliant music making and artistic innovation. And we will now enjoy a musical performance that includes new and archival recordings. So we hope you enjoy the concert portion of tonight's event.
Fantastic. That concludes the concert portion of tonight's programming. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. There are certainly some magical and heart-touching moments. Um, up next on this evening's program, I'm looking forward to introducing you to Mark Dirksen as he will walk us through the new Dirksen website. Mark is the youngest son of Richard Wayne Dirksen. He was raised in the cathedral during his father's tenure as presenter, and he became a church musician himself and holds degrees in organ and choral conducting. He also has had a very diverse career in non-musical fields as well, with work in the nonprofit sector, business management, and realty. He has been instrumental in the planning and execution of the centenary celebration, particularly as regards the website was created. So welcome, Mark, and we're looking forward to having you lead us through your work. Thank you, Alyssa, and it's great to see so many friends in the chat box. Um, hi, everybody. It's wonderful for you to come out tonight, and uh, I hope that you're hearing pieces both old and new. I'm sorry we didn't have the Jubilati Deo. I saw somebody just come across and mention that. We couldn't, couldn't do everything because there's a lot there. And um, I'm going to share the screen of the website. And I'm not going to do a whole lot of clicking around because there's really nothing much more boring than watching someone click around a website. Uh, I know this from my own personal experience. Uh, it's pretty intuitive. Um, the uh, various sections are there at the top. And as I'm talking, you'll see pictures come across. There's mom and dad. Um, they were not regular cruisers, but that was the trip they took to Alaska. And uh, mom was very, very, very happy about that. Very happy. So Wayne started as a performer, as you can see. That's John Fenstermaker there in the background. Uh, the second division, of course, is composer with the complete catalog of all his works. Uh, all of his works are uh, logged and up there in the catalog. Every piece has its own page, so you should go and take a look at that. Uh, those of you in the Glee Clubs uh, will remember this, this kind of scene. Whitby Jim uh, with Wayne in full white tie and tails uh, concluding one of the shows. I have no idea what show that is. Uh, Impresario, that was a title that Margaret Shannon gave to Wayne upon his death. And it really is accurate. Uh, he, was a, he was an impresario at heart. Uh, he knew how to put on the big show. And there's mom and dad again. So, uh, like I said, I'm not going to do a lot of clicking around. I will just show the menus. Um, I hope everybody can, can read that OK. But uh, Wayne did start, of course, as a performer, as uh, most musicians do. Conductor, accompanist, his years with the Choral Society were uh, extremely formative, uh, I think profoundly formative to him. Uh, organist, of course, is his uh, instrument. Um, not really a recitalist so much. Uh, he did his share, but um, he had other fish to fry. And then as a pianist, uh, and this is something that's been revealed to us by the transfer of the operetta recordings to digital, his piano playing is torrential. Uh, I, I cannot stress enough how uh, incredible the accompaniments are, all of it accompanimental, making the kids sound great, but you listen to what he's playing and doing and it's just, it's mind boggling. So, composer, again, I'm not going to, <laughs> the catalog is all there, I'm not even gonna click through to it. It's very intuitive, every piece has its own page, uh, there's commentary, uh, many of them have scores, many of them have audio performances from the archives, from Wayne's own uh, archives, so performances that have never been heard uh, anytime soon. Um, it's really as a teacher, uh, we're very impressed by Wayne's uh, uh, presenter, uh, presenter days and all the big things that he did. But I think we have to realize that um, it was as a teacher and as a, a working with young people that he really touched the most lives. The Glee Club certainly, but the choirs and the choristers. And uh, also on the website, you see memories and reminiscences there. Uh, just many, many tender, tender reminiscences about just how kind Wayne was. Um, so that's very moving. Uh, Empresario, again, um, this is really uh, where uh, uh, Neil Campbell um, was kind enough to say in his article that he wrote that um, at one point Wayne was probably the most influential layperson in the Episcopal Church. And it would be hard pressed to, uh, to think of somebody else uh, who, who fits those bills, certainly in the 60s and 70s. Um, Life and Times, I'm going to come back to Impresario, but Life and Times, again, this is just sort of the straight ahead um, uh, timeline, family information. 
a little article in there about Washington, D.C. Washington uh, has come a very, very long way since 1946. I can see heads nodding all over the Zoom. <laughs> uh, it's really uh, uh, quite interesting to see how Wayne and Paul and the cathedral slotted into and really helped develop the cultural life of Washington, D.C. They were the only act in town for quite a while. So sound engineer, producer, again, uh, lots of interesting stuff there. Now I am going to click through to this, writings and scholarship. He's, Wayne has been the recipient of uh, some pretty formidable scholarly activity, uh, especially by Father James Junipero Moore, who you see here. Uh, first, with a complete uh, rundown of the hymn tunes, uh, it's a dissertation for Catholic University, and then an American tradition, uh, sacred and secular music of Richard Wayne Dirksen. That is, in fact, a full biography, a full scholarly biography. Uh, Father Moore, um, obviously, is a fan, <laughs> and he is with us tonight, and I hope he's going to get a chance to, to talk in the Zoom session at the end. But um, I commend those two, I mean, it's, uh, everything you wanted to know. And then, uh, so writings about Wayne, but also I want to commend to you uh, these two pieces, again, dissertations, Kitty Yang, A Complete Musical History of the Cathedral from, 890, from 1893 to 1998. Absolutely um, exhaustive, but not exhausting. Just a wonderful survey, and anything you want to know about the cathedral music program in those years can be found uh, there in depth. And also a Stephen Hendricks, uh, a complete history of the boy choir, the National Boy Choir and Boy Training. These two dissertations have not been seen, or uh, well, they've been buried in the archives. Here they are. They've gotten permission from the authors to put them up here, and uh, again, I commend them to you with all my heart. And then reminiscences and tributes, as you can see down there. Um, so that uh, that is something I really did want to call out. Um, the only other thing that I uh, wanted to highlight, and then I will shut up, but um, in the impresario uh, section, the major liturgies page, because it's got one of my very favorite quotes from Wayne. <laughs> uh, he allowed us how the clergy were sometimes jealous of him because it's always fun to operate heavy machinery and there's nothing heavier there's no heavier machinery in the world than a cathedral liturgy at the top of its game so on this page major liturgies uh, there's there's a lot that comes off this page state services of course uh, the funerals about which there's really not much to be said because they speak for themselves but here you see uh, there's some memos some technical memos about uh, by Wayne and shows how he did it. And from an administrative point of view, you know, how are these things produced? How is he able to to make everyone come together and do this? Do put put on these these productions, and those memos there um, uh, show how that is. Dedications, of course, were his specialty. The South Transept, which Neil mentioned, the Tower in 1964, the Nave in 1976, and of course the completion in 1990. Sort of his. Uh, uh, swan song, if you will. But the small dedication ceremonies, of which there were dozens and dozens, are equally uh, almost, they're almost more beautiful um, because of the care and consideration that he always put to, for a stone or for a window or for an arch or for a carving uh, to put together those things. And last but not least, bishop installations. And uh, there's a lot underneath that heading. <laughs> So that is going to be it for the screen sharing from me. Um, uh, it's all pretty intuitive. There's a search engine on there. And oh, by the way, there's a donation button. And last but not least, uh, if you like the website and you like what you see, the people who helped design it and put it together and who are running it are a company called Third Side here in Champaign-Urbana, where I am. And uh, they happen to be Episcopalians, which is always a plus. But they're also musicians, and they've been invaluable. Third Side. And I'm giving them a strong referral. If you need any website design, design work at all, they're your people. Alyssa, back to you, and thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And uh, definitely do, I, we encourage you to make a donation uh, to the GoFundMe page on the Richard Dirksen, or if you'd like to support Cathedral Music, uh, all you have to do is visit www.cathedral.org slash music giving, and your donations will go to support programs like these uh, and concerts and worship services as well. So the next, uh, I think the next activity we're going to do is a bit of a hymn sing. So please join me in raising your voice.
The next portion of tonight's programming is a conversation and um, presentation by Thomas Sheehan, my colleague, organist at the Cathedral and Associate Music Director. Joining Tom is George Steele. George is an alumnus of the Washington National Cathedral Choir of the Men and Boys, where he sang under the direction of Wayne Dirksen, first as a treble and later as a countertenor. He is also noted as a conductor, composer, producer, pianist, musicologist, and teacher. He is presently the Abrams Curator of Music at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Since he was involved firsthand in many performances of Dirksen's works, large and small, he is the perfect person to tell us more about the musical style of the wonderful composer. So we're looking forward to having you both. Wow, we thank you, Alyssa, and uh, thank you, Tom. Lovely to see you both. And uh, uh, let me say what a pleasure it is to be with so many people who know so much about Wayne's music and career. So uh, I offer my handful of observations with a lot of modesty. Tom, am I meant to go on at great length, or are we uh, chat? Why, why don't Why don't you begin? I'll jump in if if there's anything I want to just highlight. But yeah, you start off. Uh, well, I'll say a couple of things, uh, but yes, it's true. I came to the cathedral in 1976. My mother was in the Choral Society for many, many years. And in 76, uh, Wayne went before the ladies of the Choral Society and said, we need boys in the junior choir. Uh, and so my mother suggested I audition and I was very excited about it. Uh, when I heard that the boys sang on TV at Christmas, that was all I needed to know. And uh, I joined the junior choir under Wayne for a, a year. And then the next year he took over the senior choir and a, a phalanx of us boys went with him. Um, so I started with Wayne when he took over the senior choir in 1977. Uh, and it was a wild time. We sang the, you know, we sang in the 1979 prayer book. We brought in the 1982 prayer book. We, John Walker's tenure as bishop. We sang for the presiding bishop. And this big change from right one to right two meant that Wayne was suddenly writing a whole new set of canticles, an enormous number of psalm chants, uh, hymns, and we sang things big and small. It was a, a thrilling time. He, you know, he's one of the three people on the close, I would say, in my decade there, who was the most, by far the most influential. Um, just a guy who radiated joy of music making, um, radiated kind of moral uh, fiber, uh, and was just, you know, an, an idol, an enormous tall guy. Uh, and to us little guys, he was uh, uh, absolutely an idol. That's excellent. So. Uh... Uh, as far as the musical style is concerned, we've talked a little bit about this, but uh, what what do you think this music is? If you were to just sort of put it in a big picture sense, what what are some of the hallmarks of of this music? I know I have I have my ideas, but I'm interested to hear yours too. Um, you know what's thrilling about hearing all of this music is how many different styles there were. Um, when I was a choir boy, I saw a narrower band of works because we tended to sing premieres or we sang pieces that Wayne felt like he wanted to bring back. So he brought back that beautiful uh, funeral anthem, Now the Warrior's Task is O'er. And, you know, he called in a handful of us to come sing a memorial service. And it was amazing. But it turned out it was a work from the past. And he was, every once in a while, he would conjure these works from the past, either ones that had been published that we sang all the time, but things like Jonah, which sort of appeared out of the blue, and uh, they amazed me because they were so far beyond, they reached way beyond you know, his C major communion service. They were pieces of ambition and experimentation. And I got wind, for instance, that Wayne had written a quintet or a sextet, I should say, for piano, string quartet, and clarinet. And I asked about it. I was a young composer at the time and um, hanging around with my scores. And he told me about this piece, but he was sort of embarrassed by it. It was, it, he treated it as though it were a youthful excess and a dipping a toe into modernism. Um, but in fact, there are many, many pieces like that phenomenal organ sonata, which I'd never heard, which has some music in common with the sextet that you played. I mean, amazing. And I'm so yeah. most excited when Wayne wanders outside of the world that I know him for um, and surprises me. So I would say his style, you know, you, you can hear all the theaters and folks I've been reading the chat, but, you know, there was this, after the middle of the 20th century, this kind of interest in uh, medieval church dramas, uh, which I think was a big part uh, of Wayne's imagination. So not only Noah Greenberg's, you know, uh, play of Daniel, but, uh, uh, you know, the revival of those plays, Stravinsky's take on those church dramas. 
Um, and Wayne has many, many sides. He has this extraordinary theatrical side where he's writing little arias like Elizabeth's song that was in the Annunciation story. He had a kind of a bigger swinging 70s side than I knew about, but um, you know, Mass had a gigantic impact on him, which I hadn't appreciated. I saw and worked on the revival of Mass in 81. Uh, and in 1980, Wayne prepared us to get ready to sing Bernstein's Third Symphony, um, which seemed to me like music from outer space. And I was amazed Wayne could play the whole thing at the piano and understood the way it was made and clearly revered this music. Um, so that was uh, astonishing. He was always surprising us with the influences. But I would say, you know, yes, Hindemith, yes, Stravinsky, yes, Plain Chant, um, to a degree, Britain, but not as much as you might think. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to take apart a couple of those, uh, specifically what, what he gets from each of those things. The thing that I have sort of seen the plain chant influence so much in is, is his rhythmic uh, treatment of, of the material, that there's just this free flowing idea about meter where, where you're in a meter, but then, you're, then the meter will just change. There will just be an extra beat, there will be an extra half a beat, there are things like this. The, um, the five, four bar will turn into two, three, four bars and you, it, it just kind of gets all uh, um, irregular that way. And the hymn tunes do the same thing a lot of times. Uh, the, the most famous one uh, that comes to mind is Innis Free Farm, uh, Christ Mighty Savior, um, where you get the long and short notes mm -hmm. right, that create this sort of twos and threes uh, alternating thing, but not in a sort of syncopated mixed meter -y way. It's, it's just about long notes and short notes. And I think that just comes straight out of plain chant, right? Well, it comes out of plain chant. It also, uh, you know, it comes out of American music. It's what Copeland was doing after his Stravinsky-ish period with uh, Nadia Boulanger. It's what Leonard Bernstein was doing a lot of. And I think, frankly, Wayne had a, the same kind of rhythmic fluency as Bernstein, that he would, you know, for all the crazy mixed meters, it all sang so beautifully. Now, part of that is his incredible gift as a composer and as a rhythmic thinker, but also as a teacher, you know, when I, I heard that performance of Chanticleer, I could remember every added two or three uh, from his showing us. And, um, you know, so his joyfulness as a conductor and as a teacher also matter. But I would and say that the, you're absolutely right that the meters are, uh, they, there is a plain chant side, but there's another kind of, uh, it's, it's what was happening with the great American composers in the mid century. Sure, sure. Yeah, Ch Chanticleer, I think, is a really good example. The, 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 the stretched measures in that where you just get an extra one, it feels like what those do is they, they create an added um, uh, emphasis and, and sort of sense of anticipation to those, those measures, because he, he does that on exactly the right harmonies. The, the harmonies that you want to just last a little longer are the ones that just end up lasting a little bit longer. It's, it's just excellent. Um, just see in the chat a, uh, a reference to a cartoon of Wayne throwing darts at a dartboard with different time signatures. That's great. <laughs> there were, uh, you know, we would, of course, he liked to use handbells when we sang plain chant. And there were frequently times when there would be, for instance, a handbell ostinato. And in, in the, the Come Thou Holy Spirit Come, the so called golden sequence, Wayne would have us handbells playing straight eighths, for want of a better word. Ding, 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 ding. And so you sang, Come Thou Holy Spirit, come and from the da di da di da da, be da be da di da di da da. So that was a place where you felt the connection between the irregular and yet somehow apt meters of chant and Wayne's sort of interpretive thinking. Um, that, that, that little handbell astronaut almost sounds like a change ringing pattern too. It almost sounds like it has a sort of peel aspect to that. Well, I think everybody on this call probably knows that Wayne's son, Rick, uh, who is also on the call, ran the tower for many, many years. And uh, the two things I know about change ringing I learned from Rick um, or from Wayne, but uh, absolutely, you know, he was constantly thinking about um, those kinds of permutations. And, you know, the Queen's change famously appears in one of the this alternate ding, 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 ding. Um, oh yeah, the, the, the thirds, yeah. yeah. Appears in, I've forgotten the piece now, I should, someone, someone in the chat will know instantly. It's actually uh, the last uh, anthem that he wrote. No. Sing ye faithful, sing ye uh, with gladness. Well, there you go. There uh, you go. He claimed that was his, his favorite anthem. He said it was the best thing he ever wrote, but that the whole ending of that is based on the Queen's change. There you have it. Amazing, I love that. Yeah, Rick, please join the conversation. You know, you know these pieces inside and out. So, um, yeah, there's also um, that you brought up uh, Stravinsky. There, I feel like there's a uh, 
there's a, a declamatory nature that you get in Stravinsky with how the syllables are, are grouped. They, the, the words just kind of line up and you get, you get melismas, but then in between the melismas, you just get syllables. And I, I noticed that in Jonah when I was listening it, to it this time, there's elements of Symphony of Psalms, Rake's Progress, um, Stravinsky uh, material from that period. Um, I would say the mass. In, in Jonah, what I hear is the short, sharp shocks of arah, bap, arah, ah, you know, yeah. those kinds of things are very Stravinsky. And, but I'll tell you one of the pieces that I learned from the website, which I'd never heard, was this piece written for NCS's 60th anniversary. What is that? <laughs> Wayne oh, had this. Sorry. Part. Sorry. Girl Welcome. <laughs> um, and so, you know, how do you get 300 girls to sing a piece of music, some of whom can't read music? And so he has these rhythmic spoken parts. Um, and what's astonishing is it reminds me very much of Stravinsky's Requiem Canticles, which were written two years later, but which combine rhythmic spoken text with sung text, sometimes in the same tempo. Um, and it's an, first up, the Requiem Canticles of Stravinsky are mwah, fantastic, lean, strange uh, pieces. And I would say Stravinsky had a deeper love of the grotesque than Wayne did. Um, Wayne could enjoy the grotesque because he liked theatrical gestures. And I think, you know, Mark pointed out that, you know, that he thinks of Wayne increasingly as a theater composer. And I, I think it's absolutely true that any composer writing for a liturgy is a theater composer. And I think Wayne impressed upon me this idea and my, and all of my peers that, you know, the largest artwork made by the West is the liturgy of the church. You know, whether it's a simple year of, you know, nine services a day, or if it's a three year cycle, depending on your uh, calendar. I mean, it is a gigantic thing, which needs buildings like the cathedral to take place. And um, so I think Wayne is very much, you know, we see it in these performed liturgies, the Annunciation story, the Ballad of the Transfiguration, which we brought back, uh, Wayne brought back in, in my period. Um, but imagining, you know, moving around the building performing these various spots, you know, the way he ends that, uh, uh, the bit from the fiery furnace with, you know, the Borden bell. Um, and that was a constant theme. And, you know, when we did the TV services, Rick and his gang would ring changes on the handbells and then they would fade to the tower, for instance, or you'd hear the carol on at the beginning, like the, the whole building performing uh, was very much in Wayne's mind. Right. And that's something that I've gotten as I as I've looked through this music more and more, because uh, for those of you who don't know the full story, we now have uh, we've we've reclaimed uh, Wayne's complete archive, which he put together, which is just just incredible that we that how well curated and organized all this stuff is. But it's it's a copy of every piece he ever wrote, at least one copy, some of them many, many, many copies. So this has fed into this project in a really big way. But um uh, as I've looked through this, I've been I've been struck by how many of these pieces are cathedral specific, uh, site specific, and they they use like you say they use aspects of this building, this place so so well, and it's so native to this place. The bells, the organ, the space, the yeah yeah. It's just it's just really really interesting to get to know this because a lot of people don't write things like that today. Um, Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. people have cathedrals to write them for either. Well, exactly. Yeah, but but you also don't find as many people writing for their own home as much. Uh, for the most part, composers write things and they write them for an audience that's outside of themselves. You know, and uh, and I, I just I just found it really interesting that that he's he's not trying to get this stuff performed. Well, what's interesting is the uh, degree to which, it, well, it's hard for me to hear these pieces not played on the cathedral organ. Right. So, you know, the re and many of the scores, as you know, have a lot of very specific registrations. Some, you know, and the, the section in Chanticleer where he wants mutations in the organ, it's really written for those Brustwerk or whatever they're called, Rook positive. Yeah, the gallery, gallery divisions. Yeah. Perverse mutations. Yep. Um, you know, and of course, the fanfare for T.S. Eliot is unimaginable without that particular outer space sound of the trumpet on um, And what struck me was I would, there might have been one or two occasions when I would sneak in and play the organ. Um, and I discovered this whole other side of the instrument that did not sound like Wayne Dirksen. That was the surprise, because the choices he was making in his registrations, the choices he was making were, you know, away from the romantic orchestral side of the organ. 
Yes. Away from the luscious strings, away from the flauto mirabilis or whatever it's called in the solo division. And, uh, you know, even the French horn, which is a magnificent French horn on the organ, uh, other choices he was making. Some of these weird, you know, it, it's the, the, the surprises of things like the Baroque revival, you know, the, the fact that those, they had those crazy divisions of the organ, you know, we heard it in the harpsichord. Um, but I think the sound of that particular instrument, and of course the other ones he grew up with and brought to the cathedral, affect not only his choral writing, but his thinking about orchestration and his thinking about, um, you know, the way, the way your the fourths and fifths are such a part of the harmonic language. Um, you know, that comes right out of mixtures. I mean, I think it's really Wayne creating that brilliant sound that he associates with organs um, in say choruses or orchestras. Right, I think so often that organ building of this time period in particular is less about, um, well, it's exactly what you just said. It's about rejecting the romantic often and, uh, and saying, if, if we just set that thing that we've been doing that organ building has been doing for about 50 or 60 years, you know, um, aside, and concentrate on something completely different than that. Uh, what what is there? And then you find all this stuff that you know that harkens back to to older older styles of organ building. But you also you come up with like you say you don't you don't need to write in old styles to do that. You can you can find all these new harmonic ideas like the use of um, the use of the octatonic scale in a lot of this music, I find really interesting. And we as organists often associate that with uh, early 20th century French music. Um, or Russian music. Uh, well, that's what I was gonna say. Uh, Non-organists associate it with a much wider variety of music, which is, uh, which is what I'm getting at. Stravinsky list, um, all these people use, use the octatonic scale all the time, yeah. And- Leonard Bernstein was a huge nut about the octatonic scale, as a matter of fact. But yes, you know, and and you don't get it in the usual French way where you set up a chord and then plane it through the mode um, and leave all the spacings basically the same and just let the mode do the work for you. It, it's used it's used in a totally different way, which is really interesting. And that, that organ sonata movement that I played was is littered with the octatonic scale, but at no point does it sound like Messiaen. Right. Um, we, we've, uh, we, yeah. we, we've named we've name checked uh, a lot of them. Let's just be sure we name check Britain as well. Oh yeah, who, who is like exploding yes. with the octonic scale at a couple of different points in his life, and also combined the dramatic and liturgical senses and so on and so forth. So, That's right. I mean, just, you can't think of liturgical drama without without thinking of Britain. Um, well, I mean, in the two big liturgical drama works of the mid-century, Britain's Noah's Flood and Stravinsky's The Flood, which was a TV <laughs> show after all, um, and a phenomenal. By the way, Stravinsky's The Flood is amazing, um, mm -hmm. and they both have these. Chester mystery plays or wherever, York mystery plays, whichever ones they are. Totally, clearly Wayne was eating the stuff up with a slotted spoon. Um, the piece that's the outlier is of course Thraney, which is a pretty dark and intense piece of Stravinsky's. And uh, we heard mentioned that, you know, Wayne was the rehearsal accompanist. I, I've heard the legend, I was not there, but I bet my mom was in that performance that it was a catastrophe that, that Paul Calloway conducted Thraney. It was, you know, I cannot imagine how- Rick, 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 Rick has the story. I Rick. was in that oh. particular performance. Rick. I was a senior at St. Albans that year, and uh, Paul asked me to come sing with the men because uh, so many had fled the Choral Society once they got wind of, of, of that piece. And they wound up with a pretty small group. And uh, we took off and we went through that piece uh, start to finish. Um, I should say that what preceded it uh, was a performance of... Uh, uh, Boulanger's uh, uh, Somme du Fond de l'Abîme, one of the most beautiful, you know, uh, romantic pieces you can think of. And then comes Traini. And um, we went barreling through this thing and came to a dead end. And the audience in the cathedral was dead silent. And part of that was because in those days, they didn't clap after performances in the cathedral. It was considered to be not, not proper. In this case, Paul stopped, he turned around, he looked at his watch, he said, we still have 22 minutes on the orchestra clock, we're gonna do it again, if you wanna hear it. <laughs> turned around, half the people left and we did it a second time. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well wow. that goes to, I mean, well, I'll just- prime. There that, was a moment when- such a Paul Calloway thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Actually, I believe the first piece on that performance was the um, uh, the Washington premiere of that wonderful uh, uh, barber uh, organ 
uh, piece that he premiered up in oh, Philadelphia. Takata Festiva. Tocata. The Takata Festiva, yeah. 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 And uh, that opened the program with Wayne conducting the orchestra. And <laughs> I heard uh, speak speak uh, about that piece. He didn't think the world of it. I, in his later life, he didn't like it so much. But yeah, that was his legs were too short for it. <laughs> Perfect. Tom, is it possible to uh, to bring in uh, the rest of the family? I think we had talked yes, about having Jeff absolutely. and Laura. I think, and, uh, I think you know, we're, maybe we're, Neil, get Neil back on the screen. I yeah, don't know yeah, how we yeah. can we're, do that, but we'd love to. We'd love to hear more about uh, if if anybody here has a particular uh, recollection, good memory of a performance of a piece, or just a just what have you. Um, We'd love to hear it. Well, since you mentioned the barber, I'll tell you a story that Wayne himself told Roy Perry and me one night. Oh, and, God. Uh, uh, and this was the was the night that that Paul played the deck, the, the opening, you know, the premiere performance of the barber in in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, after it was over, I can't imagine there must have been some kind of uh, festivities afterwards. But for some reason, on the way home, Paul was let to drive. And of course, we don't want to open up that floodgate of stories, but uh, <laughs> this is pretty tame. Uh, but in those days, this is before I-95, the only way to get across the Susquehanna River was the Conowingo Dam. And I don't know if you've ever been across it. On one of my trips north, I, I took a memory, you know, a memorial drive over it. And it has these, they're very narrow lanes and very high uh, uh, concrete barricades. As they were driving along, as I say, Paul was driving. Wayne said he was in the back seat and sort of dozing off. And he said all of a sudden he was awakened by this loud scraping sign and a sheet of white sparks going, you know, flying by the window. And Paul just says, oh, I'm a little close. And with that, they went on. But he had to be back. The, the, the thing that took away was that he had to be there for a rehearsal the next morning at eight o'clock. I just, you know, you, I just can't fathom doing what, you know, playing the premiere of this thing with the Philadelphia Orchestra conducted by Ormond, but he had to get back for choir practice the next morning. <laughs> that is priceless. <laughs> and I, I uh, had the privilege of turning pages for Paul on, on many occasions. And even as a young child, and, and um, when he was working up the Takata Festival, um, I was kind of at his side trying to figure out when to turn and how to turn and all that. And in between uh, takes or whatever, he would uh, kind of mutter something about E Power Biggs, except not <laughs> in the most. <laughs> 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 so I, I always remember that, but you know, my, my experience uh, actually goes way, way back because um, as a page turner, I didn't never had the musical gene, but I could read it and I could understand it and all that. But uh, Rick will remember uh, our living room out in Kensington, Maryland. Uh, the evenings that they would rehearse with Werner Lywin and John Martin from the National Symphony and Wayne on the Steinway. And I would sit on the steps having climbed out of bed. And then when it came time to perform, okay, when it came time to perform uh, down at the Library of Congress, uh, I was his page turner kind of at the age of nine or something. <laughs> it must have been, must have been right about there. And that's where I fell in love with the, um, Houseboat party, which which hangs <laughs> the voting um, party at the Phillips. The Phillips. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah. Phillips. But I mean, it was just a, such magical music that was made in that house and everywhere else. I mean, I commend to everybody on the call Wayne's album, his LP of the complete works for uh, flute and piano of Beethoven. Um, his playing is amazingly good, and you can still find copies of that LP on uh, eBay. But it's incredible. It was a revelation to me to listen to. Uh, him and some other totally other kind of repertoire. I, I will mention that that uh, there's a selection of those up on the website of his flute and flute and piano pieces, and also Wayne playing the only the only solo piano pieces he did, Beethoven bagatelles like wonderful piano piano school grade B. So it's <laughs> like incredibly when, simple music. But when was that recorded? Is. Was that when he was like in the thick of working at the cathedral? Or was oh yeah that yeah that was thing? that was nineteen. What do you think, guys? 55, 57, The mid fifties. Mid fifties. Okay. But it's up on the website. It's 
they it's, played those everything is on the website. I mean, <laughs> well, well, you know, the other thing about the website and um, a, a lot of the music that was performed uh, during that period of time, particularly the early 70s and late 70s, um, I, I was the sound engineer at the cathedral from 1971 to 77. And, and to me, it was just all a blur. I mean, if you look at the year 1976 alone, I mean, what went on in that cathedral was just the culmination of just this frenetic effort to get the nave built and to get the, you know, and get the-, the organ rebuilt and, during and that same time. Performance yeah. after performance after performance then to drop the, the, the shows in the middle of this thing. And in the middle of that, it was also 76 when um, our, our grandfather passed away. Oh, wow. And, it, you know, to, to put all that, it was just uh, an amazing time to live through. And then you took the deep breath at the end of it and then realized that the uh, cathedral was pretty much out of money at that point. Right. <laughs> it was time to um, shift gears, as we say. <laughs> I remember those 1976 services. I came as a junior choir, but, but I saw Martin's Lie in the Nave with you, Rick, carrying Simon Jackson, if I remember correctly. <laughs> all yeah. the way on the Nave. That was a hell of a walk. And, uh, and I remember the Queen's visit. And I remember, you know, that was the first time we got to sing when I was in the junior choir, Wayne brought us up for Palm Sunday. We sang that wonderful Palm Sunday intro by David Coring that had a special cameo for the junior choir. But yeah. There's a Palm nice Sunday liturgy by, that Wayne wrote, isn't there? There's a... I don't know. Isn't, Mark, you would, you would know about that. Isn't there a Palm Sunday full? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Palm Sunday intro and then, uh, one of his uh, uh, jazzier hymns, Royal yeah, David's Son. That's right. Royal yes. David's Son, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, a, nice, a nice replacement tune for All Glory, Laud, and Honor if anybody wants to take a swing at it. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote that for the N'Gomas. Yeah, he did wrote that for the N'Gomas. There was a gift of uh, these two enormous African drums, enormous African drums from an ambassador from, from Africa. or amb yeah, Rick, let's help me out here. Yeah, and uh, well, anyway. There it is. <laughs> they were locked in the South Transept for many years. Yeah, well, they, they were originally there because they were going to premiere uh, the Misa Luba. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I guess, I forget, it's the 60s or something like that. And uh, it called for N'Gomas. Mm -hmm. And Wayne called up a guy named Mickey DiPerzu, who ran Drums, Drums Unlimited out in Bethesda. <laughs> he said, I need a couple N'Gomas. And Mickey said, who? <laughs> 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 so... Uh, we didn't think more about that. And then um, a day later, he gets a call, a cold call from a woman who says, I understand you're going to do the Misa Luba. And he says, yes. He says, you want and the Angomas, you'll need them. <laughs> and it turns out she was the wife of the ambassador. Wow. Banganyika, wow. And they actually had a pair of them. Amazing. So Wayne said, well, sure. And so she said, they're awfully large. You won't get them in your car. And Wayne said, I think I can. And he grabbed Paul Calloway's car, which then was a Buick convertible. He drove out and he picked up these two huge drums in the back of his car out in Bethesda, drove straight away over to Mickey DePerzer's place in Bethesda and called him out. He said, Mickey, those are in Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he took them back and they, they worked fine in performance. The story goes on, though, because a year later, out of nowhere, two in Gomez showed up at the cathedral. And there was a note attached to them that said simply, these are a gift uh, because you are going to be working with other groups like the African drummers and uh, you will need N'Gomas in the future. And uh, we had these made specially for you by the drum maker to the king of Tanzania or whatever it was. There wow. Amazing. <laughs> that was the way Wayne operated. Serendipity, he called it. Incredible. Yeah. And I, and I'd like to know where they are right now, but... Uh, Neil, Nobody what do you, Neil, what do you, what do you, Neil, what do you remember, especially from, because you were in and out of the cathedral a lot in the, in the 60s and 70s. What do you, you, that, that story about being in the South Transept is primo, but what else? Uh... Oh, give me a minute. Some others will come up. <laughs> ah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I mean, you, you know, you've been, you've been a fan a long time, so. 
Well, I, I sort of hung around the cathedral a lot. And uh, I mean, everything was magic. I mean, there was a real, uh, George was talking about the sound of the organ and it's true, it had a unique sound. And uh, I, I was fascinated to learn from you what you told me the other day that uh, when they did these uh, choral, when they, the fourth, was it the fourth Sunday where they had all musical even song, no yeah. sermon, that, uh, that they you know, sort of brought in pieces from the previous, Months so that they could get a second hearing, and that so people who had their own Sunday services could hear them in the afternoon. I thought that was fascinating because I heard many of those, and uh, one of them again is up on the site where Wayne's accompanying to hear my prayer, and that's it's kind of rare that he he played those accompaniments. It's a beautiful, uh, just as he did on the piano, he did with the organ too. Is a fabulous accompanist. That performance of "Hear My Prayer" is absolutely prima, yes. 1959, and yeah. it's yeah. yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Is it on the website? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. Just, just going to keep <laughs> mentioning that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if one of you, Dirksons, remembers when we, we used to sing that tune, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, that we sang, we recorded it. Oh, on that, that. That, that Appalachian. Yeah, that's a beautiful Appalachian tune. Yeah. Because I was saying to Tom that, you know, that's a whole other influence on Wayne's music is folk, this strange mix of folk music, plain chant, and uh, accompanied recitative that kind of comes out in his music. But that tune, God Me Thou Great Jehovah, seemed to have a big, Wayne was in love with it. And I wonder whether you remember how he came by it or when. It was before I, 1977 on some choir camping trip to the Appalachians. I got nothing. I think that, um, was it Tony Furnival? I think that, or Anthony Piccolo, one of those guys early on wrote a, a, a setting of that, which Wayne fell in love with. Oh. Tony Piccolo, I think. I think it was Tony Piccolo, yeah. Wow. Very yes. nice. Well, play. well played, sir. <laughs> you got a copy in my head. But this is a single line of melody. We recorded it in 77 with just the trebles and handbells. But I'm interested, I mean, did Wayne have much interest in folk music th that you saw in the, from the family vantage? Not really. Don't, gonna say some, no. <laughs> some of the canons, I, I keep, when, particularly that first canon from the, uh, from the concert tonight, uh, that has a real sort of folk music kind of thing going on to it to me. I mean, I get old tent revival hymnody like in Vigas yes. from after this fantastic modernist moment. And that's the only one of the choral exercises we sang with the senior choir. But then suddenly this charming, almost, you know, Methodist tent revival hymn tune, but of course it has Wayne's usual perverse metrical shifts and then it was a whole other thing, but it's, there's some, there is this sense of listening back to an older kind of music, of older kind of church music that I get. And, and a, a particularly American brand of it. Absolutely. And, a, a, you know, middle American nostalgia almost, um, which is amazing to hear in the middle of his most modern. Yeah, there's still sort of the Great Plains and, you yes. know, okay. Okay. fields and, yeah. <laughs> okay, there, um, you, you, you brought it out of me. Right. Um, <laughs> In uh, on the website, there's uh, his, his his hymn "Let Us with a Gladsome Mind," which is a rock a rock and roll hymn, in six four to nine four, uh -huh. alternating six four and nine four. So good luck with your rock and roll band with that. But on the website, there's a recording of that hymn, and Wayne talks about playing the piano with his with his with a couple of saxophones playing for the for the tent revivals in Freeport growing up. Amazing. Wow. So a living connection, and so the, that recording on the website. Is Wayne, it opens up with Wayne. I couldn't resist putting up there Wayne talking quite effusively about, uh, and then the hymn itself is uh, the, the Texas by John Milton. So, yeah, that I mean that's clearly Wayne's piece that is the most sounds the most like that where Mass tempted him out of his. Yeah, company. that would be that would be it. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Well, right and, and although I couldn't help but notice that in Chanticleer that it says that you know if you're doing it with piano that you can add electric bass. Well, th yeah, there's a recording so, of that. There's a recording of Chanticleer with electric bass, but that's not for public. That's not a public recording. I'm not putting sure. that on the website. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but it's in the score. It's in the published score from Flammer. I know. So, I know yeah. it's in Flammer. It's right there. Hey, knock yourself out, but I'm not playing it publicly. You got it. Uh, <laughs> I saw you, Rick, in the revival of Mass in 1981. Um, and I wonder, what were you in the 71? I know there was a lot of Cathedral Boys were in the 71 performance. Yeah. Were both, I, I was both the original in performance also in 71. And so was I. I remember was Tom Pratt was on the cover of the LP. Yeah. And Wayne was in it too. He played Big Al, the organ. Well, that I remember. 
he claimed, uh, he told the story about Bernstein coming in and handing him that impossible cannon, which is and they Wayne wrote it down. <laughs> that is that is that is a spectacular piece, Mass. That's um, that's. Any, a I, I see that there's stuff coming in on the chat. Do anybody have any? Thank, thank you for your comments. Does anybody have any questions specifically before we? The, the time is going on here, Laura. Yeah, you ask about Laura Dirksen. She, her the, the internet connection is raw, and she can't. She she's not able to get in, and she's she says hi. We had planned to have Laura here. Um, I'm here. Oh, what? There she is. Uh, I'm here. But throughout the whole evening, I've I've barely been able. Yep. As I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Sorry, Who's Laura. Laura? <laughs> Everybody. There you are. Oh, there you oh, are. Hello. And um, you can um, you can talk to me um, off of Zoom any anytime. I would like to say one thing. Mm. Out of all the people that have been, you know, students and admirers and everything, I, I think I can say honestly that I'm the one person, I'm his daughter. And? And? She froze up. Oh. She froze up. Yeah, it's, it's really. Oh. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tech. Tech. Um, well, yeah, and but. To Mark's point, um, while we figure out whether Laura is coming back, uh, does anybody have any questions for our? Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is the panel. This is the time to ask it. Um, yes, uh, Tom. This is Justice Parada here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I have a question about as a composer and organist is: Have there been any analysis analyses done on any of Dirksen's compositions? I've done a little bit of amateur okay. analysis on it, nothing published and nothing that I would, uh, you know, but that's that's just part of the way that I learn music is by trying to figure out what, what it's doing. So I, I have my ideas. I just haven't yeah, written them down. <laughs> one, of the good, um, one of the things that may be a good source to look at in terms of Stravinsky's influence on Dirksen is Pete Vandentorn's book on Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. um, uh, George, are you familiar oh, with the uh, Landon Torn book on I, Stravinsky? Yeah. Yes, okay, because um, one of the uh, things that I saw and heard throughout the choral pieces, especially Chanticleer and the Benedicite, is pitch centricity, where he will emphasize a certain pitch. So I'm at the piano right now. So, for example, take E, and then he'll have contrasting material around it. So. That is a big thing with Dirksen clearing over from Stravinsky. Yes. And then the other technique um, that he uses is interruption continuation. This was made famous by Le Sacre du Printemps, by the famous movement with that chord, which is. So it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it's essentially cutting off or adding on that is um, a, Strav a Stravinsky technique. I will write down the techniques in there and I will also put a link to Vandentorn's book on Amazon because that that's like a really good book to have when you you can you can see that Neil you see that Neil Campbell is leaning forward writing notes. Neil is writing a second article on on I was just Wayne's say, style. I was like, just say I haven't Neil? finished that yet. What was that pitch? What? <laughs> one one important thing to note about both Stravinsky and Dirksen is that Stravinsky, of course, wrote at the keyboard, uh, and he wrote mm -hmm. the string of the keyboard. And a lot of those ideas of having a single pitch with things moving around it are pianistic are keyboard based ideas. Right. Yes. Finding and Wayne's music is not a surprise at all. What is a bigger surprise is to find out how much music Wayne wrote away from the keyboard. And of course, famously, the proverbial canons are just such pieces. He claimed he wrote them at a picnic table or something, Rick. Is that right? That's exactly right. The, 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 the entirety of Galileo, the entire score for the, for the instrumental music to Galileo, he wrote, at, he wrote at a table in Chicoteague, Virginia, not a keyboard within 10 miles. Same thing with the canons. He wrote them in our backyard with yeah. kids playing yeah. around him. Yeah. No piano. Yeah. Right. 
So there is a whole other side of Wayne's writing, which is not keyboard based. And it's fascinating to think about for, and of course the cannons are not playable on the keyboard. <laughs> no, they're not playable <laughs> right. on the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> they just aren't. <laughs> Plenty of very skinny fingers. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but, one yeah. thing that, uh, that was just pointed out to me in the chat is that we have uh, Father Moore here, James Junipero Moore. Good. Who... Good, I actually went to school with Father Moore. Oh, excellent. We uh, yeah. Father, are you, there you there are. There you are, yes. Welcome. Hello, Father James. Hi guys, I'm just taking this Hi. all in. This is this is really wonderful, good. you know, uh, from my perspective, I've, I, I've studied Wayne's music and I, of course, I've talked to the Dirksen boys uh, and Laura and, uh, and uh, been able to read a lot of it and perform it, you know, myself uh, as a conductor and as a priest, uh, you know, trying to schedule it in the liturgies. But uh, hearing you guys talk about it is, is just incredible because you lived it, you lived through it. And this is uh, pretty exciting to hear all, all, all this, uh, th th this talk about it. It really, really is wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you for, for the work what you've done you, on the hymn what, tunes and, and the rest of the-, the Jim, what did, well. what did you hear tonight that was new for you? That was, that was, a, that was a learning for you? Well, you know, I don't know how much is new, but it's just reconfirming stuff that we've talked about before, especially his, his musical influences. Um, also, just though, you know, just the, the wide variety of stuff, uh, being a, a Catholic priest, I'm always interested in people's faith, too. And uh, uh, just I'd never know that he ever thought about becoming a clergyman. Um, and I, I studied that part of his life. But uh, but uh, that was kind of a new thing. But I really, really just. I knew the amount of stuff he had to do, but incredible. When you brought up that story about him driving back from Philadelphia to work again. I mean, this is the workhorse. This is the age of the giants, man. Those are really just incredible stuff. My, I was the last doctoral student of Leo Nestor, and Leo would pull stuff like that. I mean, that, that's, that's the kind of stuff. Old <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that's Leo. Amazing. Yeah, well, um, this this is wonderful, and um, I'm just uh, just looking through the. Am I uh, am I on? Uh, yeah. Jeff, we can hear you. We can't see you, but. Oh, okay. Well, I'm I'm somewhere in the Ethernet. I uh, see you. You know, just, yeah. just uh, there you're back. To, there you are. I have to give a shout out uh, because we've been concentrating on this very one aspect, or you know, a lot of aspects. Uh, but I see up here on the bar, uh, people who are attending here that really weren't really quite musicians as such, like myself, but, but we had the pleasure of being under his spell. And that particularly is, uh, belongs to the Glee Club members. And I see there are Glee Club people up there. And uh, we all felt, I know I did, and I think they did too, that going through a rehearsal with Wayne in the teaching mode and trying to learn the operettas and trying to learn the music and we couldn't read or whatever it was, but we always had the feeling that music was just shooting out of this guy's fingers and he could just walk into the room and elevate a room and totally capture it and somehow music would happen. No one knew, really knew how um, and I refer again to the website, uh, some of the Glee Club performances from the 50s. I mean, uh, you won't find singing like that in no. any professional courses. No. And, you know, and, and even maybe not so much my era, but, you know, it was just that constant diligence and preparation and professionalism and made us better. He just, he, 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 the, the tide lifted all of our boats. <clears throat> Excellent. I think that's that's exactly what we're what we've been trying to get across with this is just that this was a, a, a real consummate musician and churchman and um, performer and composer and it, it, the list goes on and on and on and there's so many different facets of this. And uh, on that note, I think I think we're going to to wrap up this evening's uh, celebration. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for, especially to our contributors, to Neil and to Mark and to George and uh, to the performers from the concert and, and uh, just everybody who's, who's had anything to do with uh, organizing and, and putting on this, this amazing event. So uh, I will just 
kick it back over to Mike McCarthy. Do you uh, do you have our our closing selection ready to go? I do, folks. And again, look, thank you to everyone for tonight. I know a lot of work has gone into it, and it's uh, I hope the start of a celebration or a, a, a rejuvenation of celebration around Wayne, who when we get back in person and able to sing again, uh, there's a real intent to have a lot of his work out there as a sort of post celebration of his 100th year. That's so uh, thanks to everyone. Um, there is a final piece, uh, which you will yeah, sign. Mark, do you, want, do you want to say just a couple of words about this final piece, just I, by way of contextualizing absolutely. what we're about to hear? A absolutely. This is, uh, this is the American Adventure March that um, Wayne wrote the music for a, 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 an attraction in 1976. Um, all orchestral music, no choral music involved, but uh, this is the closing march for the American Adventure. One minute and 45 seconds. Name the tunes. See if you can spot the tunes. And there you have it. He loved he loved to turn things into marches. <laughs> Thank you all again for coming. And uh, to the Sacred Music Festival participants, we'll see you in the morning tomorrow. To everyone who's not in the Sacred Music Festival, we will uh, we will see you sometime. Thank you again for joining, um, and it's wonderful to see you. <laughs>